Hi, everybody. I think we're officially live now. We're still getting the, the kinks out a little bit as to uh, how this is all working. But uh, welcome back to uh, week two. Feels like week 200 um, of uh, quarantine mode and, and Tuesdays with Tom. And we uh, I'm excited. I'm excited today to, uh, to bring you guys kind of a, a unique uh, version of our content and uh, have my, my really good friend, um, longtime buddy and, and two-time Olympic gold medalist, uh, Brad Schumacher, um, on the call with us. So, so Brad, welcome, and, and thanks for, for taking time to, to be on with us. Hey, I appreciate it. You know, it's obviously interesting times, but, um, you know, we're connecting more and more every single day. That's for sure, right. all these issues. That's right. And and, and for everybody that's, that's uh, Googling right now, uh, one, of the, one of many cool, amazing facts about Brad is he was – uh, we were Olympic teammates in 96 in Atlanta, um, in swimming, obviously. And then Brad was actually on the Olympic team in 2000 in water polo, um, which is one of only a handful of athletes in the history of the Olympics that has done that. So um, not to mention Brad has roots in Maryland. And uh, so he's a hometown boy that lives out in California now. And we'll get into a little bit of kind of Brad's business background and, and what he's going through. Um, Brad and I uh, swap a lot of stories and, and uh, uh, share a lot of business kind of um, unfortunate realities in the current climate. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But, you know, I think for today, um, <clears throat> for, for all of you, um, what I'm what I'm excited to, to, to kind of have Brad share with us, and, and I'll certainly chime in too, is um, something that I think is really a, a, applicable, obviously, and appropriate right now is we're all dealing with this, um, you know, just incredible historical time with the pandemic. And um, and being stuck in our houses, and some of us are, are trying to keep our businesses, you know, just uh, afloat and moving forward. And um, and we're all that have kids at home, you know, trying to balance homeschooling and working and um, keeping the household sane. And there's a lot of there's a lot of variables out there that um, that make it challenging. And I think that one of the things that I always um, fall back on uh, are the skill sets and the and the, and the kind of developed techniques that athletics brought. Um, and for Brad and I, that swimming brought to us and for, for Brad water polo brought as well. Um, but I think this idea of um, in adversity and in times that are not ideal um, and, and certainly out of our control, um, there are a lot of great, I think, life skills that sport teaches us. Um, and I think athletes on an elite level when it's applied properly to the real world, um, really have this huge kind of bag, if you will, of skill sets that can be applied. And I think that's what I'd love for, for Brad and I to talk a little about and share with you guys. Um, as always, you guys feel free at any time to, um, to ask questions and uh, we, will, we will get to as many as we can. And, and we want you to help drive a lot of this conversation. But I think for the first couple minutes, I, I wanna just be able to kind of set the stage a little bit um, and last week I touched on kind of the, the, the fact that we should all be taking things hour by hour and day by day. Um, and I think we're all trying to do that with our kids, um, with ourselves, maybe with our businesses, um, certainly with our households on a daily basis. But I think for, for Brad and I, um, you know, we've had the unique experience of uh, competing at a very high level, at an Olympic level, um, and a sport like swimming. And along with that, to get to that level, uh, it does require a lot of compartmentalization. Um, and a lot of how I look at the best way to kind of deal with adversity is to learn how to compartmentalize properly and control the down to the tiniest details that you can control. And then also not get too stressed out and, and, uh, and too worried um, in the moment about the things that you can't control. I know for, for me with asthma, that was a, a huge learning lesson that I had to go through um, through my years of swimming. But even running a small business, um, it's it, it directly applied to to understanding how best to take care of my employees and customers, and also understand that um, as much as I want, you can't you can't control everything. Um, so let's start, Brad, and just kind of get right into it. Um, I guess share with us a little bit of um, kind of athletics first, but then business side next. Um, how through the years, and it even obviously helps you today, you have kind of honed that ability to stay very much in the moment 
um, and, and keep it hour by hour, whether it's COVID-19 related or not. Um, and kind of what, how did you learn that through swimming and water polo? And then how did you apply that um, in running your own businesses, which we'll certainly get into in a minute what those are? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Tom. Happy to be here, of course. And, you know, I think what's really interesting is, is in these times, like, you know, we and us as athletes really do fall back on those really strong pillars of, you know, number one, taking a look at what can I control in my life at this moment and not worrying about the exterior things. As an athlete, we all had to do that because there were so many things pulling at us from outside and to stay focused on the ultimate goal, you have to have a really clear plan as to how you're gonna reach that goal. And so when I think back to my sporting career where you know I was juggling swimming and water polo, trying to compete at the highest level, um, you know, I mean, talk about world champs when we were roommates and, you know, I was in your roommate for two days of the 20 days. And so I was jumping back and forth. And so really focused right now on this idea that there's certain things I can control in my world. So I, I want to take a step back, which you started talking about with, with your, your daily routine and going hour by hour, but even taking it a step forward and actually writing down what your schedule is, not only with your kids, but with the whole family and doing a team meeting with the family so that the kids can start to understand that if they are doing remote learning, it starts at X time, they have a break at Y time. And I'll just use my family as an example. When, when we do that and we sit down, then the kids have that normal structure that we are usually in when we're racing to get them to school and then they race off to baseball or swimming or lessons or whatever they're doing. But that actual schedule gets posted on the wall and then everybody can expect it. And so, you know, it's a simple thing at 1230, you know, there's PE. And so you go outside and do PE and, you know, working from home is, you know, it's kind of unique. You get creative, but there's tons of material right now that's being created online on YouTube and so on and so forth for kids, for everyone. So I encourage you guys all to take a look and, and do some exercises and maybe it'll, you know, for me, it's been great because I've actually gotten in some more workouts than I usually do it's sitting at, sitting at a desk all day. Right. That's right. for sure. Uh, so um, just as a side note too, um, just share the ages, of your kids, number of kids, that sort of thing, just so everyone can kind of relate. Yeah. So I have, I have three children. I have a six year old whose birthday is today. Nice. Um, so that's a unique challenge of, you know, explaining why there's no kids coming and there's just us for his birthday party. Yep. Um, so six, uh, four is my daughter Paloma and then 18 months is uh, Paolo. Um, I didn't realize Tristan's birthday is today. Yeah, it's today. Dude, Connor's is Saturday. Connor turns two on Saturday. I didn't know oh, their birthdays were that close. Yeah, it's crazy. You know? yeah. So, not but anyway, that, you know, I, no, no, I think it's, uh, you know, with them specifically because you know, they are so young, it really is important to have that structure because they're really used to, you know, my daughter going to preschool, my son in kindergarten, they're used to that daily structure and they only have a small portion of time, you know, that's, you know, sort of free play. So I, I really encourage all to, you know, take a, take a minute and write it down and, and you'll start to see that you'll spend less time worrying about, you know, what they're saying on XYZ news channel and you'll focus on, you know, taking care of the things that I can control because that's the key, you know, right now. And, you know, we talked to, you know, a little bit about athletics, but, you know, we can talk about our businesses. I, I'm involved in a couple of businesses, one being a nonprofit swimming and water polo club that I direct. And the second one uh, being my main business called Cap7 International, which is um, a swimming and water polo supply company. So, you know, this part, you know, requires, as, as Tom and I, as Tom alluded to that, you know, we sort out how we can take care of those groups of people during this really difficult time and how we, you know, prop our businesses up and make the right decisions with all these programs going on. So, you know, having colleagues and, and doing calls and bouncing things off, you know, how, how people understand these things, because it really is a uh, challenging environment for the businesses. But what I do know and what I'm really, you know, positive about is that this is going to end. We have really smart people figuring this stuff out. So we're going to be going again. So I, I'm not concerned about that. What I want to do is, you know, get people thinking about, okay, what do you need to do to get ready to get going? 
You know, that's, I mean, something that, you know, I'm thinking about daily is like, all, what are all the things that get put on the back burner that I can work on now that I normally, my staff doesn't have time for. So that's what we're focused on. You know, we're focused on the details of the business and getting ready to open back up because that's what we all have to think about is, you know, how fun it's going to be when we go back to our normal, you know, everyday lives. And yeah, there'll be some changes, but for the most part, we'll be able to jump right back in there. Yes, that's great. Um, look, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of directions to go from that. I, I think uh, the two things that jump out at me that, that I think are, are really important to share with everyone. One, the, the day schedule. Um, I think that a lot of times, and, and you, and you've had, given speeches like this, Brad, just like I have, where you talk to a, a let's say a swim team or a group of kids or even a group of parents, um, and you try to relate the, the kind of short-term goal setting that's required to get to an elite level. And I think the, 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 the mistake I think that all young kids make when they look at kind of elite athletes, whether they're Olympians or, you know, NBA players, is that it's some mystical, magical pathway to get there. And that you kind of snap your fingers and if you have all the right physical or mental traits, it just happens overnight. And I think that uh, through the years, there, there, it never gets old to emphasize how important that, that short-term goal setting is. And, and, and in these days, I would translate that to the idea of a daily schedule. Because as much as it's about what are we doing today, you hit on it exactly. It's about structure. It's about expectation of, um, what what should be accomplished today. And that doesn't have to be this grandiose, we're going to break a record. It's just, this is what time we're going to have breakfast. And this is what time we're going to, you know, uh, work through an hour or two of schoolwork. And this is what time we're going to have a break and go outside. And, and I think we're all kind of trying to stick to, to stick to some sort of schedule, right? But I think it's a challenge. And every day it feels like the same. And so I think for most people, um, this is so out of the ordinary that it's hard to kind of find that structure. Um, I think for athletes, everything is about structure. There's no athlete in the world that has achieved an elite level in whatever their particular discipline is that hasn't done it in a structured way. And so I think applying that to our current daily lives is really important to focus on and not in some intense like, you know, you've got to conquer it all in one day. It's just simply laying out what's going to happen. And I think our kids thrive on that. We all know that as parents that kids thrive on repetition, right? Structure is repetition. Repetition is structure. And, and, and no child out there wants to just go, oh, let's try it this way today, whatever it is. They want the same thing, right? It's the same reason of anyone that has kids, whether you have one or a hundred, you know, there's no such thing as they get bored from a show, right? They could watch the same Paw Patrol episode 500 times and the fifth hundred the, the 500th time is just as, as, as awesome and exciting to them as the first one, right? And it's just how they're wired and they love that comfort. So I, I think that daily schedule is really important. Um, and I think the content of the daily schedule is less important than doing the daily schedule. I mean, I'm a big believer in, I think you got to take steps in the right direction. I don't think you have to be uh, at an expert level with those steps. I think it's better to get it going and then refine and maybe perfect it as, as time goes on. Um, I love that side of it. The other side of it, I think that, that I think is, is really great that, that, that you touched on at the end, which sometimes the end is, is the best place to start in these types of conversations and in, in helping, I think, provide ideas and, and, and concepts that we've used at an Olympic level that can be, can be directly applied today. And that is the, the belief in the end, right? One of the things that I'm a, I know you believe this, Brad, and I'm a firm believer in it too, is, <clears throat> and sport teaches you this in different ways. I think different sports offer this in a, in a, in a, in maybe a different perspective. Swimming very much is a straight line. And by that, what I mean is you set a time goal, um, you set a technique goal, whatever it may be. Uh, it is a very direct line of either you achieve that goal or you don't. Um, but the underlying belief of it is if you've done everything you possibly can do to achieve that, there's no reason you can't achieve it. So it's a very positive thought process of it's not a matter of if you're going to do that. It's just a matter of when. You know it's an inevitability because you're going to work hard enough to achieve it. So it's just a matter of when that happens. 
sure, you may fail in that first competition. Um, so that timeline isn't the same, but you're not doubting whether it happens. And that's a belief system that every elite athlete has to have. Um, I'm a firm believer that that's the businesses that will get through this, have that same belief. Just like you're saying, this is not a woe is me moment in time. This is a, we know we're going to get through this as an organization and let's get a competitive advantage out of it, which is exactly what you're saying in the, in the form of where can we get better? What can we be working on right now? And I think that is, that is not a mentality that everybody wakes up to, right? I think that is a learned mentality that is, um, I would attribute for myself personally, I'm sure you would say the same, from years of athletic endeavor of challenging yourself so that you have a belief system that it is going to work out. And sure, it may be a windy road if I can do winding through the camera inversely, but you're not questioning where that road is, is going. Um, to me, that's a huge takeaway right now is we can all get through this and let's use this time. If, it, if we're talking business, how can we get better as a business? Sure, it seems like, wow, there's some dark clouds out there, but it will end. And I'm a firm believer in the idea that look, there is always positive in negative. And one of the positives as a small business owner is to say, one, I know we can make, make it through. Two, let's get better as a business while we prep for getting through it or that end point. And then once that end point comes, we have the potential to be better even than we were before because we've improved during this time while others maybe have struggled and haven't looked at it as positively. So I love that kind of end, that end view. Of, of never wavering and never questioning. And I'm a, I, it's my belief, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure it is yours too, Brad, that it almost has to be built back from that. So in other words, that daily schedule really is only best applied if you have that end goal in mind that we're, we can do this, we can make it through this. So now let's work backwards from that positive thought process. Um, yeah, Tom, I think the other thing that, you know, that I wanted to share with folks and parents, because I'm sure we have quite a few parents who have younger kids on, on the phone is what you alluded to a little bit around, you know, the ultimate goal of, you know, being successful in a sport at the elite level. And I just wanted to, you know, talk a little around what, what I did as a, as a kid and, you know, what my parents did for me. And I can tell you when I was six years old or seven years old, the, there was no thought of the Olympics. There was no thought of the Olympics at 13 or 14 for me. There's no thought until I was actually in college. And so, what my parents did is they gave me the, the fundamental skills when I was five and six and seven years old and, you know, with swim lessons and then taking advantage of, you know, pushing through to like the technique stuff. So they gave me a great technique and a great fundamental swimming base, which allowed me to continue to improve. And I think that's where, you know, the services that you provide obviously are you know, very, very important to that. But, you know, I went to a specific coach once I went through all of the swim lessons to continue to refine my technique. And then my parents more specifically, they always supported it and they didn't have any sort of expectation as to how I was going to, you know, achieve or gain a result at a particular meet. They were my support. And so I could always rely on that. So I felt zero pressure, which, really helped me to perform and that's why I was able to you know you know reach the the podium twice and you know all, you know often I say is like you know uh, you know it's obviously very impressive what you did you know back to back you know Olympic champion and it's like a whole nother level but in the end I think what parents need to you know to really understand is take a step back and understand that your kids are going to put pressure on themselves anyway because they want to do really well so if you take a step back as a parent and go, you know what, you're doing great. And you're obviously, you know, it's not kumbaya and you're always doing great. You know, sometimes that conversation has to be, hey, I don't think you were trying as hard as you, you should. Yeah. But those lessons for parents and, you know, for me as a kid, like knowing I had that tremendous support, which, you know, we're all trying to do, you know, it's sometimes difficult not to be critical. And so for me, I know specifically with, you know, my son's already in, you know, gosh, she's six years old he's already played, he's in his third season of baseball yeah. i mean it's it's incredible is yeah. making sure that they don't get sucked into a sport too early and too focused on it and that they enjoy sport and sports should be fun 
and they should be excited to go to swim lessons. They should be excited to go to water polo practice or soccer or baseball, yeah. but they should be sprinkled in and testing everything along, along the way. And, you know, as I said, when things open back up, you know, I'm hopeful that, you know, more people recognize how, and how important it is to stay active and get their kids out in sport, you know, because yeah. I'm sure everyone's getting more screen time than they've ever thought they would. Um, especially with kids on zoom meetings and so on and so forth. But, you know, I just, I think it's really important that parents in this moment take a step back and say, you know, how can I be positive with my son or daughter when I'm, I'm really getting challenged with becoming a school teacher because yeah. man, it's challenging for me to <laughs> sit down and, and, and try to do the schoolwork. I, it's been, you know, I've had to really look inward and say, okay, you know, slow down your heart rate. You, know, you have patience. Kind of, He's gonna, he's gonna get it. The whole he's new gonna level, get it, you know. Right? But I mean, I think it's important, you know. Like we all yeah. have to think about that and, and and really not place undue pressure on the kids because they, yeah. they have enough of it already. Totally agree. It's great points. Um, just for everyone out there, I'm looking away. I feel weird looking away. I'm looking at my text to make sure I'm seeing all the questions that are that are coming in. So that's why I'm looking away. But um, yeah, look, I, I I think we could do a whole other call. Uh, to be honest with you, just on kind of as athletes, w what did we learn that transfers over to, to us as parents now um, that I think would be really applicable and helpful. And um, we go back a long way, everyone just, just so you know, and as Brad mentioned, we were roommates and on a lot of different levels, we go back a long way. So there's a ton of content happily that, that we could get to. However, um, we don't want to take up too much of everyone's time. So let's get to some questions, Brad, and we'll kind of, we'll try to just rip through a bunch. Um, yeah. yeah. We'll, Quick and dirty. We'll, we'll start with uh, with with uh, taking it on a, on a lighter note. Um, so my so for 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 those of you that don't know, I have four kids: uh, a six year old, a five year old, uh, a three year old, and my one year old is about to turn two on Saturday. So my three year old has has texted in a question uh, that Brad, this is definitely for you. Uh, so my three year old son's name is Fitz. Um, how big is the water polo ball, and does it hurt if you get hit in the head? Yeah, so a, a water polo ball is a it's a size five. It's like the size of a, a soccer ball. Um, okay. I can oh, get so into the specs. With a soccer ball says size five, does that actually translate to water bowl, polo yeah, ball? Yeah, they're rough. They're roughly the same size. Um, okay. but, but yes, if if you take a hard water polo ball and you get hit in the face, it hurts. But so then I'll there's on behalf of my one year old about to turn two. That question is really asked because he's probably about to take one in the head. From yeah. pets. Oh, well, I'll have to send you down some of the neoprene ones that are nice and soft that that, that we start with the little kids with so that they don't do that. Because inevitably, uh, you know, a six year old kid right. tries to tries to beam his, his brother on land every right. single time. Right. And hard rubber balls are good for that. <laughs> yep. All right. So we'll stay in the water polo world a little bit. Um, kind of both, though. But so this this question is um, Again, again for you, Brad, and then I'll jump in a little bit at the end. How did you decide to compete in water polo and not swimming in your second Olympics? Great question. Um, and then which sport did you enjoy doing at the Olympics more? Yeah, so um, World Champs, 98, I did both. And after I had, went through that experience, keep this answer really kind of you know, short, is that it just became too difficult for me to wrestle with the Russians and the Hungarians and then a day later, try to have a peak performance in swimming where I was supposed to be resting for three weeks. So it was really about um, that. And then coupled with, I didn't feel it was fair to the water polo team to ask them as a group to let me sit out of games so that I could reach a personal goal. Yeah. And so I had to say, you know what, you know, I'm going to focus on this. Uh, when people ask me what is more fun, um, I enjoy winning. So, you know, we won the FINA Cup in 97 in water polo, and I had just come off winning medals in 96. So, you know, obviously, you know, it was more fun on the swim team because I was in control of one person. It was more challenging on the water polo side. We ended up getting sixth place, by the way. It was, it was, it was disappointing. It was a hard, it was a hard Olympics, but um, it was challenging, more challenging for me personally, because you had to have 13 or excuse me, 12 other guys playing at their best for the entire two weeks of the Olympics. And so that to me was a really, I mean, it was super challenging in that side, but you know, look, I think Tom, you you can talk to it, but you know, reaching the podium once you've done that and that becomes the ultimate goal and you did it twice, four years apart is, 
it's a really challenging aspect. It seems easy when you do it the first time, but I always say, you know, I, I won my first, you know, in my first Olympics, I was like, oh, I'm just going to do this a couple more times. And I spent the next 10 years of my life chasing it, mm, literally yeah. chasing that podium. So, um, but you learn a lot in that as well. And I have no regrets. That's for sure. Yep. It's, um, that's a, that's a whole other call in and of itself, but you're right. It's, uh, it, it's hard to, I think it's hard to, to describe, um, that how difficult that journey is. Um, but look, I, I think the quick thing I would add to it is, um, what, what, what comes out of it, whether you're in your forties looking back or in your twenties or teens, whenever it happens, um, is we all end up in the same place, which is, it was much more about the process than it was the end result. And I know that sounds like it should be an ad. Um, and I think for, for younger kids, sometimes they don't believe that. Um, but in fact, that is true. And that is the reality of why we all stay in it. It is the process. And sure, the goal matters and we want that goal. But I think the life skills that we get out of it, which we talked earlier in the call about, those all come from the process. They don't come from what what that ultimate kind of outcome was. Those skill sets are, are, are gained um, and then can be utilized regardless of what that outcome was. And that's, that's the beauty of sport, right? Um, all right, so just to, to get through a couple more and then we'll wrap up. Um, Krista has a, has a question, uh, which is hilarious and very relatable when we were teens, but, but a good question right now. Um, she says, I have teens that don't get up until noon. What are some ways you got yourself up early to swim? Uh, great question. If Brad had more time, I guarantee you he would have added in to one of his answers about which sport is more fun is that the, the not fun part of swimming is what time we're getting up and, uh, and, and, and what it required from a daily schedule basis. But um, uh, why don't we both take this, Brad? I, I would say um, the w w one thing I, I would start with is what Brad talked about before we got into the Q&A, which I think is really important. I don't want to take up too much of everyone's time delving into it because it's such an important topic. It's hard to just skim over it. But I think the parental role um, in a sport of swimming is, in my opinion, more important than anyone else's role that's involved with that swimmer. Um, and by that, what I really mean is there is a very fine line between helping provide structure versus living within that structure with your swimmer. Um, and I think Brad's story with his parents is is identical to the story with my parents um and i think it's it's very kind of um counterintuitive for what a lot of parents view that olympic process to be in other words I, I just know from tons of conversations with with parents they think that the more involved you are the more you want it for your child the more successful they're going to be and 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 almost across the line if you were to survey olympians it's the exact opposite of that um, yes, which isn't 100%. easy. We're, we're parents now too of multiple kids, and it's not easy to 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 truly kind of respect that and understand that because you also want to feel like you're being a good parent and you're invested. And in, but there's a difference between wanting it more for yourself out of them than wanting it for them. Um, and that is a th those those two realities are very very far apart. If I could make this far apart without messing it up, I would. Um, but I would say this to answer the question, um, I, the motivation has to ultimately be internal for your teens, Krista. Um, I know that in your, in your mind now you're saying or out loud saying back to us like, yes, that's not helping because they're still sleeping till noon. So how involved can you be to help structure that? Part of the way I would answer that is actually back to kind of where Brad started with us, which is daily schedule and sitting them down and talking about a schedule. Um, I also think that there needs to be a very real world conversation of what do they want out of it? What is that? What's their goal out of it, right? Whether that's a daily, weekly, monthly, or season long goal, what are their goals? Because again, almost applying it to the reality of what we're currently living through from a business perspective of believing there will be an end and you're going to be successful still. And how do we work through that? I think with your teens, you can do that too, which is start with the end of their goals and then say, okay, so that's great. You've identified those goals. Let's talk about how those are going to happen. Do you think those goals will be achieved by sleeping till noon? Right. And then, and the answer will reveal itself and it doesn't come out in such a kind of forced way of, of, of my way or the highway, which could drive them away from the conversation altogether. Um, I think it allows them to find that pathway themselves without feeling like you're forcing it upon them. 
but also gives you some leverage as a parent to say, look, I'm just trying to help you lay this out properly. And you're the ultimate decision maker in this. Um, but if these are your goals, then doesn't it make sense that this is going to be required, right? Um, and it kind of then would eliminate without you having to say, you better not sleep in. Yeah, I mean, I just add a little bit there, Tom. I, just, I would just also ask the question is, what, what's the cause of them, um, especially if they're a swimmer, um, yeah. that, that they're sleeping till noon when their normal routine would be, you know, a couple of days a week, if not three or four, being up yeah. super early and swimming. So, you know, is there a screen in the room? Are they staying up late, texting with their friends, like whatever it may be? And then taking that cause route and looking to, you know, say, hey, guys, like, look, Monday yeah. through Friday, Monday through Friday, let's let's stick to our schedule that we've written down here. And the first thing that you're going to do when you wake up is just like, I would be driving you to the pool. I'm your ops manager. That's why I look at, you know, the parents as like the ops manager. And so I need to, you know, get you to the pool in this situation. I need you to get you outside into some sort of exercise, some sort of routine, some sort of workout right when you wake up and then we're going to come back and eat breakfast, yep. you know? And so that to me would be for Krista, like a really good starting point. I like that. Maybe, maybe also another way to say it is less Joe exotic at night um, and, and move on from the, from the Tiger King on Netflix and get yes. to bed. All right. So we'll, we'll get two more um, Joe exotic plug in there. Uh, two more um, quick ones and then we'll wrap it up. Um, we'll, we'll get the last one. You got to keep it clean, Brad. So we'll get to that at the end about how fun the Olympic village is. Um, how many hours a day did you train leading up to the Olympics? You know, good question. I think kind of ties into Chris's question a little bit, just in the sense of um, what what does that world consist of? Um, so I'll take half of it and then uh, then I'll hand it to you, Brad. I, I mean, I think interestingly enough, for a sport like swimming, um, our answers vary because we swim different events. So uh, Brad was much more of kind of a sprint mid distance guy. I was much more of a mid distance distance. Uh, guy by that um, in the events that we swam um, and therefore what we trained as how we trained uh, varied in yardage depending on the the events for so for those of you out there that don't fully kind of understand that um, think of it in the sense of um, if Brad is focused on say 50 free 100 free 200 free um, his his training cycle and what he's going to work on each practice um, while still will be fast swimming uh, it is not as much distance based as what I would be working on for the 400 individual medley um, or any mid distance to distance event. So, you know, the longer the event, the more more volume, more laps you're going to have to swim uh, to train your your energy systems to be able to handle that that kind of a race. So um, it does vary from Olympic swimmer to Olympic swimmer as to how many hours you train. Um, you know, for me, I, I trained uh, the, the most yardage of anyone in the world. Um, I would do a hundred thousand yards a week. Um, and you know, I look back on it now and, and I think philosophies have changed a lot that you can get quality, sorry, quantity in, um, in a little less volume than, than we used to do, or a lot less with, with more quality swims, working more on technique and more on race pace type stuff. So, um, each decade, the kind of the philosophies of training change a little bit. But the point being, I, I, my events were much more distance based. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the water um, and, and did a lot of volume of training, um, which was, a, you know, obviously a, a huge commitment. I think one of the ways I always answer this question, though, is whether it's, you know, five hours in the water and and, you know, two hours of dry land or, you know, certain days, six, seven hours in the water and then those hours of dry land. The, the reality of it is that it is a life commitment. You're, you're committing everything and you're being every day to that ultimate goal um, at an Olympic level. And where swimming comes into play very specifically in this is uh, no matter what your event, when you step up on those blocks, you have to have the belief internally that you've trained harder than everyone else and you deserve to beat everyone else. And that's where my confidence always came from for my own swimming is my self-confidence was I had every, I deserved to win. Um, I didn't look at it as like, oh, I hope I do. Or I, I looked at it as like, I was offended if I didn't win. Not in a, not in a uh, condescending way, um, but in a very much, that's how strongly I believed in the work I put in. 
and what I should then be able to get out of that. Um, so that self-confidence purely was driven by, from training and from, from the, the, the focus points that I had on a daily basis, back to Brad's point of a daily schedule. Um, and that's a long road, but I think what I would say to, to families and kids out there that are in swimming at a youth level is that's why their rungs on the ladder. That doesn't, that didn't happen when I was 10 to Brad's point. We all did a lot of sports. I mean, even in high school, I still played golf. Um, one of my big beliefs is the reason I was successful in the sport of swimming is that I stayed balanced for most of my career. Um, it was never just about that one single thing. Um, and sure, I just got done saying we were very narrowly focused, but you still have to balance life out. And whether that's with other sports or just other activities or things for your brain to kind of think about, balance is really, really important at an elite level. Otherwise, you will burn out and all that work is, is kind of for nothing. Um, so th that's how I would answer that in, in that it, it doesn't always quantify an X number of hours. I think it is, um, it's incredible at that level how much focus is required and true hard work. Um, but at the same time, all of those athletes need to stay balanced. And, and none of them just did swimming since they were little. Every single one of them did multiple sports and learned from those sports, both team and individual. And I think that's as important as, as any lesson in that question. Yeah, I think I, from, from my side, I can just I'll take it from when I was a kid. You know, I, I never did mornings. I just couldn't do it because my, my program was – in Annapolis, Maryland at the Naval Academy. And it would have required me to, you know, I tried it a couple of times, but it just didn't work. So no mornings at all through, through high school, just afternoon and evenings and weekends. So I'd go six trainings a week, a couple hours, two and a half hours in my trainings. Um, and then as I got into college, as I, you know, as I continued to progress and got into the weight room and stuff like that, and, and my specific Olympic preparation, you know, I, I'd have two hour session in the morning, two hour session in the evening, and then a weight training in between. So, um, and that's like five to six days a week. And, um, you know, as Tom said, you know, I was more of a mid distance sprinter guy. So, you know, um, I didn't need to, to go to volume, but one thing I'll talk about with, you know, with Tom and kind of throw some, something back towards him is that the reason he was able to be an Olympic champion individual on his own was because uh, of that kind of obsession to be the best and train. And even when people were saying, Hey, you're doing too much. I remember him getting back in the pool. So like, but that's what kind of led him there. So ultimately I think it's a, you know, obviously, you know, I respect everything you've, you've done, but in the end, you know, we have to, you know, we have to be in a, in a place where, you know, we're finding that balance, like you said. Yep. That's exactly right. And, and look, at the end of the day, that balance is individual, right? And I think, I think that's what we're both saying is um, there is no one perfect pathway that everyone follows. I think every swimmer, every athlete, and every sport, they find the pathway that works for them. So, um, you know, I think, I think one of the things that, that Brad did really well over his career that a lot of elite level athletes find, which is what's the, what's the path that works for me? I'm not going to get thrown off by what others are doing. I need to find out what's best for me. And I think, I think that takes, that takes time to have that self-confidence to kind of figure that out. And, um, and it's why I'm not a huge believer in the big blanket statement of like, it needs to be X number of hours or X amount of volume of yardage because everybody is different. Every, everyone's wired differently as a human. Everyone's wired differently as a, as a competitive athlete as well. Um, so, all right, we're gonna wrap up with one last question, which is about the Olympic Village. Um, and the, the, the question is just simply, um, <clears throat> it, is the Olympic Village super fun? Uh, and, um, you know, it's a good place to kind of end on because we, we wanna we keep things positive and, and we wanna challenge all of you out there in a positive way to have those daily schedules with your kids um, and with yourselves, whether that's working from home and running the household and, and helping kids with schoolwork. Um, but on a fun note to kind of answer that, you know, the Olympic Village is, is, is a fantastic experience. I think that there's a lot of different ways to look at it in, in retrospect. Um, you know, one of the challenges at the Olympics in general for all athletes is for any competition that any of us had ever been leading up to that or after that point in any of our sports, the biggest challenge 
in the Olympics as a whole, and that includes the Olympic Village, is it's actually not, it's the worst run uh, competition that you'll probably uh, attend and, be, and qualify for. And I don't mean that in a negative way, because think of the logistics of it. It's, it's so inconceivable to have all of these athletes from all over the world and all these sports all in one place, all waiting on shuttle buses and food and all these different logistics that um, the volunteers and the organizing committees of every host country and city do a fantastic job. The reality though, if I learned anything, and I'm sure Brad will say the same thing from going to a second Olympics, it's to take that expectation level of kind of perfection of logistics in the day down and, and not be thrown off by, oh, like I, I'm about, I'm waiting for the shuttle bus to go compete for an Olympic gold medal. And I've trained my whole life for this and the bus is now 20 minutes late, right? And now my whole warm up routine is thrown off for which I have practiced and, and, and set as a ritual for my entire career. And here we are waiting on a shuttle bus and that is the linchpin to this whole reality. And I think it sounds crazy, but that, but that you're so finely tuned at that point, not just with the, the physicality of your sport, but the mental side of what you're prepared for and ready for. And I think one of the hardest things is to understand that it's in a very imperfect world, um, but it's a great lesson. I think it was a great lesson for all of us as athletes to say, look, don't let it throw you off because it's happening to everyone. And I would completely relate that to this time right now. You know, we're living in a, in a bizarre time, but it's happening to all of us. And so um, I think whether you want to look at it personally or for your household or for your business, um, there are always great lessons to be learned from these and we can all get better from it. And that would be my little, you know, spiel on the, on the Olympic kind of organization side of things. And, and the reason it comes up is because the village is an amazing place. Uh, again, athletes from all over the world, cultures that all uh, mix together, um, different food options that you can have that are either really good for you or could stray away like McDonald's 24 seven, right? And did you train your whole life for, for a four minute race to, to be ruined because you ate McDonald's, you know, every day, but leading up to your race. And, and it's kind of those realities that are in play that make it such a fascinating place. Um, and again, I think we all wish that those that were fortunate to go to multiple Olympics, we all wish we, we, we knew, we, we learned from our first Olympics, we could go back and apply that to that first time again, because there, it is a very kind of steep curve of learning to it. Um, as a whole, I think we love the Olympic Village. I think swimmers are very kind of super, super detail oriented, even more than a lot of other athletes. And it challenges you because it is kind of this big, crazy place. And to stay in your lane, so to speak, and find that, that discipline that continues on to your competition was one of the challenges of being in the village before your race. I think after the race, then it's obviously more relaxing and you can kind of enjoy it and go to different sports and, and, and check it all out and be a part of this incredible global experience. But truth be told, I think pre-race, um, there are a lot of distractions there that we all had to really learn and work hard on a daily basis to kind of remove from our lives and, and stay very focused. Yeah, let me, uh, I'll just, I'll take the other side of it. I mean, I, you know, the, the environment of just really unique things, and I'll share a, share a story that happened to me in Sydney. I'm like, in Sydney, we all stayed in these like houses. It wasn't dormitories. They were all like houses, single family houses that they were going to sell afterwards. So, you know, like our water polo team had a couple houses and, you know, it was just, you know, like you're walking around, there, there would be dignitaries in the village at all times. And so it became the norm. So, you know, one time, and this is a regret of mine, I'm walking home and I'm like about to walk up my driveway to go into the house and Muhammad Ali's, you know, standing on the other driveway, like across the road. I'm like, hey, that's Muhammad Ali. I'm like, oh, I'll probably see him again. No big deal. You know, like whatever. <laughs> Didn't even walk over there and take a picture, like anything, give him a pin, like anything. And so, you know, I think it's just, you're, you're thrust into this world where there's, all these celebrities and dignity dignitaries who are coming in and there's just lots of really cool things that happen. Uh, one other thing that happened to me in 96. So for those of you who don't know, when you win an Olympic medal, um, you get the, you know, the president calls you and you talk and it's, it's kind of, it's, it's not weird. It's very weird because you're like, you know, somebody, you know, prompting them or doing whatever, but he knows tons of detail. And I, you know, I was fortunate to talk to president Clinton 
And uh, later on in the week in the village, I was, you know, walking through and there was a band playing and I happened to be done. There was a band playing in the village. So to speak to Tom's point, you know, like you're getting ready to compete. He was probably still swimming. And I, you know, I was done my races already. So I was just going in to check out this, this jazz band and president Clinton walks in and I'm like standing kind of in the front and he walks in with his secret service and he looks over and he goes, hi, Brad. And I was like, I freaked out. I was like, what? I'm like looking in his ear. I was like, does he have an earbud in his ear or something? I was like, this is crazy. It's like, how can this guy, I mean, he's got so much on his plate. How can he possibly remember who I was? But I don't know, cool things like that. Super fun. And, you know, as Tom alluded to, like one, once you're done, you really get to experience the, the uniqueness of the, the Olympic Village. One thing that I really found fascinating and I thought was really cool is that no matter what was going on in the world, where you were from, what conflicts were happening, whatever. If there were athletes from that country, you literally could be sitting right next to them and there's no politics, which is just such a cool environment to be in where, you know, our difference are, 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 are not celebrated in politics. They're celebrated in sport, which is just so cool. Like, you know, we were sitting next to all kinds of different people and, you know, meeting new folks and, you know, and, and what you realize is, you know what? swimmer in Iraq, a swimmer in the Middle East, a swimmer in Asia, they're all swimmers just like us and they yeah. enjoy the chlorine in the water, the water polo stuff. And so that that part of it for me was really interesting um, overall, you know, that we just got rid of politics completely, yeah. which was cool. Yeah, so. great point. I, I, well said. I, I think that uh, the village provides for that, right? I think that's yeah. where as crazy and chaotic as it is, it's it's a, it's a fantastic point because it it also provides a simplicity of look everybody's just there for love of sport right oh and, and i got one more fun story for everybody yeah one more fun story one more fun this is the, you know i'm going to share this with you but as an athlete for tom specifically and don't be nervous tom, i'm not going to tell some crazy stories <laughs> <laughs> but i thought one of the most fascinating things was and i didn't know how he did it is after his races he would take a bathtub full of ice cubes and water and he would climb in there and stay in there. What was it for like 15 minutes, yeah. 15 minutes. And for anybody who's gotten into an ice bath, I mean, we're talking bags and bags and bags of ice cubes inside a bath and him jumping in there in his speedo. And I used to put my hand in there. I'll be like, dude, how do you do this? Like <laughs> just incredible. It's like jumping into the water in Antarctica yeah. swim in the land or something but yeah. you know why why did you do that by the way what was the purpose was it lactic acid flush yeah yeah wow. it was it was uh it was the fastest way to remove all the lactic acid buildup in in my legs uh and it would drain it would drain everything out and it was super painful we actually started it at michigan that's when i started doing it is when we were at michigan at ncaa's and and uh most of the guys bailed on it um yeah, I I was like, oh, there's no other way to put it like i I, I, I'm not going to deny that there, there is uh, my wife would still would still say that to this day. Um, there, there is a psychosis certainly about it, but the way I looked at it was not, it's really cold. I didn't even think about it. I just thought if I believe firmly believe that that would help me and make me faster or a better swimmer, I, I would do, I would do anything. Um, if that meant cut my arm off or, you know, sit in it for an hour, I, I wouldn't question it and I would just do it. And, that was kind of the psych, psych, psychotic side of me. Um, yes. Which I, you know, some of which I, I attribute to having asthma and kind of just dealing with some, some pretty significant hurdles that I just got used to putting my body through such a level of pain that I just accepted it. And I also think part of it is how I'm wired that, um, you know, for good or for bad, sometimes in real life, it's, it's for bad. But, but I do have a, uh, and, and you've, you've seen it being my room, and I, I do have a very... Um, a borderline unhealthy, uh, which I think is true for a lot of elite athletes, uh, competitiveness and just kind of craziness uh, to me that um, the, in, for me, the worst thing in the world was the possibility of allowing myself to accept losing. Um, and I'm yeah. definitely one of those athletes, which again, this is content for a whole other call of, you know, what do you, what do you have more emotion, uh, you, you know, kind of towards the love of winning or the hatred of losing. And most of us, we would say the hatred of losing, 
the level of that, that passion and hatred of losing for me though, was so high that I was willing to literally do anything to, to not have it happen. And so, you know, the ice pass were, it were crazy. Uh, there's no doubt about it, but it was also something that I didn't even really like, it's not like I dreaded it looking, looking ahead to, to them. It was just, I just viewed it as part of the process. No different than, you know, leading up to 2000, I would go on Tuesday nights. Uh, we didn't have practice Tuesday nights and I would go by myself and, and swim between eight and 10,000 yards by myself, which like anyone that has swum before in their life would, would think like the next stop should be a mental institution uh, if you're choosing to do that. And I never questioned it any week the entire year because I just, I viewed it as this is what it will take. And, and looking back, like, you know, is that appropriate or correct? You know, who cares really to your point, right? If, if you believe that that's what you need or what you should do, then, then that's what you do. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Um, all right. So, so uh, we'll wrap up. We went, went a little longer than, than we planned, but um, great content, Brad, really appreciate the time and, and really appreciate your perspective. I think it's awesome for everyone to hear how you kind of, you know, view not just your business and, and family life and your, but your, your career and your swimming and water polo combination and how you merge all that together now, I think is the, the more perspectives, in my opinion, that we can all kind of learn from, um, the, the better off we're all going to be to get through this. Um, and, and so thanks a ton for, for joining us. I, I really appreciate it. Um, was, was awesome. Uh, I'd like to do it again. I'm not going to ask you every Tuesday to do it, but I, but I think there's a million places we can go with all this content. And, um, you know, I think for everyone out there, um, you know, again, let's, let's, let's try to follow a couple of, of rules of the road that I touched on last week that Brad touched on happily without even me prompting him, which is, um, one, to stay positive. I think, again, Brad's point of, of kind of knowing that we are going to get through this is that the reality of staying positive. Um, but then back to that daily schedule that Brad talked about and, and really compartmentalizing that day so you don't feel like it's this huge kind of leaps and bounds every time you're looking at what's going to happen today or tomorrow or a week from now. Um, and, and allow that to help you stay structured. Um, and use that structure to your advantage, not in a negative way, but in a positive way. So the kids know what they can look forward to in the next coming hours or that day. Um, and I think out of that, it allows you a little peace of mind um, that you don't have to minute by minute kind of, you know, figure everything out or, or reinvent the wheel, which I think we all kind of are feeling right now as we're stuck at home is um, every minute is this new challenge of, of, of kind of focus. Um, and so I think those daily schedules help a lot. So, um, Brad, any, any, anything else that you want to add before we sign off? No, Hey, I appreciate it. Thanks for organizing enjoyed it. And, uh, let's do it again. And we'll, we'll dig in a little bit more. Stay positive, Thanks, everyone. Thanks you guys. Have a great, have a great week guys. Take care. Thanks again, Brad. Yep.